All right, in this lecture we're going to uh, continue a chapter on capacitance, talking about the potential energy in a capacitor, and then also getting into dielectrics. All right, so energy is stored in the electric field inside a capacitor. Um, the potential energy of a charged capacitor may be viewed as being stored in the electric field between the plates of the capacitor. Now suppose that at a given instance, a charge Q prime uh, has been transferred from one plate of a capacitor to the other. The potential difference, V prime, between the plates at that instant will be Q prime divided by C. Now, if an extra increment of charge, DQ prime, is then transferred, the increment of work required will be uh, just given by, all right, a little increment of work, oops, without the prime, is just going to be the voltage prime times the charge. All right, another way we can write that is Q prime divided by the capacitance dQ prime. So I just changed the voltage to uh, Q prime over C. Well, if I wanted to find the total work that I required to bring the total capacitor's charge to the final value of, of Q, um, you would just take the integral. So our full value of work will just be the integral of our, our uh, derivatives of work, or our increments do, of work, and that's just 1 over C times the integral from 0 to Q of Q prime dQ prime. Okay, taking that integral, relatively straightforward, um, which is going to be Q squared divided by 2C. Okay, so this is the work that is stored uh, as potential energy U in the capacitor. Therefore, our potential energy is just going to be Q squared divided by 2 times the capacitance. Um, and this is going to be the potential energy. Uh, now, you can also express this in terms of the voltage, um, so that would just be one half CV squared. All right, so we have a couple equations here for our potential energy. Okay. Now, in a parallel plate capacitor, Neglecting fringing, the electric field has the same value at all points between the plates, thus the energy density U. So we're going to define a new term called energy density, and we're going to call that U, little u, that is, um, the potential energy per unit volume between the plates. All right, so it's going to be potential energy per unit volume, right? So it's basically U over V, where V is volume. Now, we can find this U by dividing the potential energy by the volume, AD, and so, so we're not using V for volume, we're just going to use AD, so it's the area of the plate and then the depth of the distance between, um, of, so of the space between the plates. So our energy density, U, is just going to be U over AD, or if we want to write that in terms of our capacitance and voltage, it's just going to be CV squared divided by 2 AD. So we just took the equation for potential energy and plugged that in there. Um, but since C is equal to epsilon naught A over D, which is one of the first results we had in the chapter, this is going to become our energy density as 1 half epsilon naught V over D squared. So we can see that the area or the energy density doesn't really rely on the area, it really just relies on the voltage divided by the depth or the distance between the plates. Now, um, we know that E is equal to the change in V over the change in S, so V over D is going to equal the electric field magnitude E. Therefore, we take this equation and plug in E, and we see that the energy density is going to be 1 half epsilon naught times the electric field squared. Okay, so let's go ahead and do an example. Um, an isolated conducting sphere whose radius is R is 6.85 centimeters and has a charge Q is equal to 1.25 nanocoulombs. How much potential energy is stored in the electric field of this charge conductor? So an isolated sphere has a capacitance given by uh, this equation, which we've seen earlier, that's gonna be the capacitance. Now the uh, energy 
U, the potential energy U, stored in the capacitor, uh, depends on the capacitor's charge Q and capacitance C according to this equation, right? And we just found that one out. So um, we're going to go ahead and take our first equation and sub that into the second. And that gets us the result of the potential energy is equal to, remember it was Q squared over 2C. So plugging in for C, we get the potential energy is equal to Q squared divided by 8 pi epsilon naught times R, which is the radius. We can go ahead and start plugging things in because we're solving for potential energy. So we have 1.25 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs squared on top, because that was our charge, divided by 8 pi times epsilon naught, which is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 uh, farads divided by meters. And that's going to be multiplied by 0 0.0685 meters, right, which is going to be uh, the radius. Okay, so solving for that, we get 1.03 times 10 to the negative 7 joules, or approximately 103 nanojoules. That's our potential energy. All right, well, the next part asks, what is the energy density? Remember, energy density is little u at the surface of the sphere. So the energy density uh, of the stored energy in the electric field uh, depends on the magnitude E of the field from the equation that we just found in last slide. All right, so here we must first find the electric field at the surface of the sphere. Um, and that's given by our equation for um, the electric field due to a point charge. It's the same equation, right? So let's see. So this is going to be the electric field is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. And our little u, I guess from the, or from the equation we found, is just 1 half epsilon naught e squared. So plugging in what we found uh, for the electric field, or what you would find for the electric field, you're just going to end up with Q squared divided by 32 pi uh, squared epsilon naught r to the fourth, right? So that's just taking this electric field equation and plugging that in for E, and then squaring it. All right, so we can go ahead and plug in our numbers now. So we have, again, 1.25 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs, oops, on top, and that's squared, divided by 32 pi squared times epsilon naught, which is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, uh, c squared over newton meter squared, And then uh, 0 0.0685 meters, and this is going to be to the fourth power. All right, solving for our energy density, we get 2.54 times 10 to the negative 5 joules per meter cubed. Now remember, we said energy density is going to be our potential energy divided by. Um, a volume. All right, so we have our correct units there. Okay. All right, so a capacitor with a dielectric. So in a region that is completely filled by a dielectric material of dielectric constant K, all electrostatic equations containing the permittivity constant epsilon naught are to be modified by replacing epsilon naught with K epsilon naught. All right, so anytime you have something with epsilon naught, you just have um, you multiply that by this k value, this dielectric constant. All right, so what is a dielectric? Well, it's something that is going to be inserted inside the cavity between two plates of a capacitor. 
right? So we've been talking about this space in between the, um, the positive plate and the negative plate. Well, if we put a material in there, it's going to change the properties of the capacitor. So um, a dielectric, it's an insulating material such as mineral oil or plastic and is characterized by a numerical factor K, this fancy looking K, uh, which is kappa. I should probably call it kappa. Uh, call, so it's called the dielectric constant of the material. All right, so the dielectric constant depends on the material uh, itself. And on the right side, it shows you a table of of some dielectrics. So you have air, you have polystyrene, paper, it has the dielectric constant, um, oil, pyrex. Um, you can see down here there's even water and then some other um, ceramics. It has a dielectric constant. So some dielectrics such as uh, strontium titanate can increase the capacitance by more than two orders of magnitude. The introduction of a dielectric also limits the potential difference that can be applied between the plates to a certain value Vmax. And this is called the breakdown potential. Now, every dielectric material has a characteristic dielectric strength, which is the maximum value of the electric field that can tolerate without a breakdown. So you notice in the chart here, there's also a couple that give you um, the dielectric uh, strength, which is measured in kilovolts divided by millimeters. Okay, so let's do an example um, with, with a dielectric. A parallel plate capacitor whose capacitance is, uh, capacitance C is 13.5 picofarads is charged by a battery to a potential difference V is equal to 12.5 volts between its plates. The charging battery is now disconnected and a porcelain slab, which has a dielectric constant of 6.5, is slipped in between the plates. What is the potential energy of the capacitor before the slab is inserted? All right, so if we look at before the slab, we can just relate the potential energy of the capacitor to the capacitance uh, C and either its potential or its charge, depending on what they give us. Now, um, and this is what we saw in previous slides. So because we're given the initial potential energy, we might as well use the one that has potential. Um, so we would go ahead and say that our initial potential energy before the slab is put in is just going to be one half CV squared, which is one half times the capacitance, which is 13.5 times 10 to the negative 12 uh, farads. And that's multiplied um, by our voltage or our electric potential, which is 12.5 volts squared. Okay, and that's going to equal 1.055 times 10 to the negative 9 joules, or approximately 1,055 picojoules. All right, so what's the potential energy of the capacitor slab device after the slab is inserted? All right, so what does this slab do to the, to the um, capacitor? So because the battery has been disconnected, the charge on the capacitor cannot change when the dielectric is inserted. So the, the charge is going to be the same. However, the potential is going to change. Thus, we must know if the equation 25-21 to write the final potential energy um, but now the slab is within the capacitor and the capacitance is going to be kappa C. So we're then going to have, uh, so our final potential energy is going to be Q squared divided by 2KC, uh, where, excuse me, kappa, where this is the fancy K. And that's just the potential, the initial potential, divided by kappa. Okay, so that's really just going to be 1,055 um, picojoules divided by 6.5, which is our uh, dielectric constant. When we do that, we see that we get 162 picojoules. So the, but the potential actually changed quite a bit. You went from 1,055 picojoules to down to 
uh, 162 picojoules. So when the slab is introduced, the potential energy is going to decrease by a factor of kappa. The missing energy, in principle, would be apparent to the person that's introducing the slab. So some, you know, if you were actually physically inserting the slab in, um, the capacitor would exert a tiny tug on the slab and would do work on it. So in the amount, so the work is going to be in the amount of the change in potential energies. And you're going to get whatever the initial is minus the final, right, because work is is um, minus potential energy, but they have initial minus final here, so they took care of the negative sign. And you end up with the work being done of 893 picojoules. Now, if the slab were allowed to slide between the plates with no restraint, and if there were no friction, um, the slab is just going to oscillate back and forth uh, between the plates with a constant mechanical energy of 893 picojoules. And the system energy would transfer back and forth between kinetic and uh, the kinetic energy of the moving slab and potential energy um, stored in the electric field. That's it for uh, this slide or this uh, lecture. We'll have one more lecture to finish up the chapter shortly.